And um, I'm going to be introducing um, Professor Ev Federonko. And I, um, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Ev Federanko. Ev completed her PhD at MIT and is currently an associate professor at the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT. Ev is an extremely prolific and influential researcher who has challenged many common ideas and preconceptions about how languages are presented in the brain. Ev studies the cognitive and neural mechanisms that enable us to produce and understand language with the goal of understanding the representations and computations that underlie our linguistic ability and to characterize the brain regions that are involved in these processes in both typical and atypical populations. Uh, Eva has received multiple awards and published numerous papers, too many to list, and all very influential. She is also committed to making science accessible to the public and to diversity in science, as is evident in the makeup of her own lab. Eva is also a close friend and a role model for me for how to do rigorous, creative, big question science, and I'm delighted she agreed to talk to us today. Um, Ev? Thank you so much, that is so kind. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, you guys, and I'm sorry we can't be um, all in person in one place. Um, you hear me okay, yes? Yep, we hear you. Well. Okay, awesome. All right, so um, this is... Um, a talk that um, I put together relatively recently for the anniversary of the Max Planck Institute, 30th anniversary of the Nijmegen Institute. So for those of you who have heard that, this will be familiar. So I tried to kind of zoom out and um, look at my research program through this lens of um, why we have language. And I wanna start with um, a famous quote by David Marr who argued that to understand the relationship between behavior and brain, one has to begin by defining the function or computational goal of a complete behavior. Only then can a neuroscientist determine how the brain achieves that goal. And so language, um, which can be very broadly defined as a generative system of four meaning mappings with some additional constraints, uh, emerged in our species quite some time ago, uh, some say more recently than others, but regardless of when it came about, we can ask, why did it emerge? To what end? And for many components of biological systems, including humans, the function is often clear. We have lungs to breathe, we have legs to walk, eyes to see, and so on. For language, it may seem clear, but it actually has been a topic of fierce debates um, for decades, um, even centuries. So two ideas have been prominent. One, perhaps the more intuitive one, is that we have language to share thoughts with each other. And we can speculate on why that might be useful with proposal ranging from um, cooperating, uh, facilitating cooperative behaviors uh, to passing knowledge about how to make tools or passing socially relevant information. An alternative idea is that language evolved to enable us to think more complex thoughts. Now, if you ask any non-scientist, why do you think humans have language? Um, and you give them these options like to communicate with each other, to think complex thoughts, both, you would find that 98% of the people include communication as the, in their answer. So 50% say it's communication alone and for 48 others say communication and thinking complex thoughts. But there are those 2%. <laughs> and uh, one of them is uh, the most famous philosopher of language, Noam Chomsky, who up to this date argues against the communicative function of language. So here's a quote from a presentation just a couple years ago, where he said, almost all of your use of language is internal. Virtually all of the use of language has nothing to do with communication. The idea that language has evolved as a system of communication or designed for communication makes no sense. Well, I beg to differ and I bet um, some of you um, do as well. So he, um, has been arguing that language evolved to enable complex thought. So here's a quote about that. The systems of thought use linguistic expressions for reasoning, interpretation, organizing actions, um, action and other mental acts. And he's not alone in this. There's other philosophers like uh, Wittgenstein famously, um, who has um, said the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. But how would we know one way or the other, right? So there's a lot of, um, debates that have rested on pure intuition and introspection. And um, uh, it's true that evolutionary questions are hard, but it still seems <laughs> that relying on intuition alone is certain, almost certainly not the right approach. 
So I will argue that there's two kinds of empirical data that can inform this question. So first, we can examine the relationship between language and other aspects of cognition, including complex thought and reasoning, to see if language may be closer in some way to <coughs> one or the other, and I'll clarify what I mean by closer. And second, um, we can examine different properties of language to see if they may shed light on what language the language system may be useful for. But before I do this, I'm gonna just introduce the brain network that supports language processing, which is the system that um, I'll be focusing on today. So we have long known that there's a set of regions in our brain in the left hemisphere in most individuals that are somehow important for language. Using brain imaging approaches like functional MRI, you can find these regions in just a few minutes of scanning by, for example, contrasting uh, brain responses to um, when people read or listen to sentences, um, versus to stimuli that are perceptually similar but lack meaning and structure. So um, sequences of pseudo words or an unfamiliar uh, speech in an unfamiliar foreign language or backward speech and things like that. And these brain regions um, thus identified exhibit a few important properties. So they respond during language understanding, uh, spoken, uh, written or signed. Uh, they also respond during language production, also across modalities. Uh, they are uh, similar across uh, typologically diverse languages. So to echo some of the points that uh, Balthazar and Sabine made earlier, um, we've been trying to increase the representation of different languages in cognitive research because the vast majority of work has been done on English, German, and Dutch. And in fact, I think some of the theorizing about the properties of the system have been um, influenced by the pretty idiosyncratic properties of these languages, like for example, relatively strict word order, I think has led to an overemphasis of sequencing, uh, general sequencing ability is important for language. So we've been trying to develop tools for studying a wider array of languages. Um, and um, uh, we're now uh, trying to start asking questions like, um, you know, let's look at some dimension that differentiates the word languages like expressing propositional relations through morphological markings versus word order. Is there something different about the neural architecture of um, languages that fall into these two groups? Okay, um, and other properties that the regions of the system form a very strongly functionally integrated network. So you can learn a lot about one region of the network by studying another region. Um, and um, finally, um, as we've long known, uh, parts of this, if parts of this network are damaged in adulthood, we end up with linguistic deficits or so problems in comprehension production or both. Another important point about the system is that the precise locations of language areas vary a lot across individuals. So I'm showing you just six sample maps from our labs database. Um, and you can see that the general layout is similar, like everybody shows some lateral, frontal, and temporal uh, bits, but the precise locations are variable, substantially so. And we have documented this variability across um, large numbers of individuals. And because of this variability, I have spent a lot of time arguing that to make progress in this field, we need to identify these regions at the individual participant level, as opposed to averaging brains together and looking for patterns of commonality um, in that way. This is the standard approach, by the way, in um, fields with generally higher levels of rigor that have a stronger grounding in animal physiology, like vision and motor control. Uh, and I've been trying to move the field towards adopting these um, tools, and I guess it's been going okay. Um, however, individual localization is not always possible, and so we've also, we're just about to release um, a probabilistic language atlas uh, based on the 800 individuals who have tested in my lab, um, which can allow you to, for any uh, position in this common brain space, which is a template that's most commonly used in uh, past neuroscience uh, of language studies and so on, to estimate the probability that it falls within the language system based on what we've learned about the probabilistic landscape of the system. Um, okay, so now onto the first kind of evidence relevant to the relationship between the language system and the rest of our mind and brain. So let's consider the spectrum of abilities that humans possess. So aside from our perceptual intelligence, um, supporting our ability to recognize objects or faces or voices, and our motor intelligence, supporting our ability to physically interact with the world, we can do all sorts of mental computations. We can do math, we can engage in logical reasoning, 
Uh, we can acquire totally evolutionarily new skills like uh, computer coding. Uh, we can create and appreciate music. We have a complex host of executive abilities from you know, attention, working memory, and inhibitory control to uh, planning and decision making. We can use these abilities to solve totally novel problems on unfamiliar abstract stimuli. We can interact cooperatively with conspecifics and jointly solve problems. Uh, we can figure out what somebody else is thinking or feeling and resolve conflicts both locally and on the large societal scale. And of course, we have a rich knowledge of the world. Um, we know a lot about the objects in the world, about the events and their typical orderings, about the physics of how objects move in the world um, and interact with each other, and about what is possible in the real world versus in our imagination. So what is the relationship between language and the host of these other abilities? Um, and of greatest interest here are the relationships between, on the one hand, language and complex reasoning, um, where these abilities kind of all fall into that general category. And on the other hand, between language and social cognition, which, as I'll tell you um, uh, shortly, appears to draw on resources distinct from those that support um, the abilities outlined in blue. Now, I'm going to try to make an argument about the computational goal of language by evaluating these relationships with the idea that um, if we see a stronger relationship between language and general reasoning, that might reinforce complex thought as the computational goal of language. And if we find a stronger relationship with the social system, they might let, that might lend uh, credence to the communicative function of language. So what do we mean when we say a relationship, right? Relationship between these two systems. So the most obvious way to examine a relationship between any two cognitive abilities is to ask whether they draw on the same or overlapping resources or whether they're distinct. So I'm schematically showing a language brain system in red and some non-linguistic system of interest in gray, and we may have no overlap like on the left or partial or even complete overlap on the right. But even in cases of fully non-overlapping systems, there might be meaningful differences in how spatially close the two systems are, because in some such cases, arguments have been made that a system was initially one and the same and later split in the evolutionary timeline. Uh, or how strongly functionally connected they are. So how much the two systems talk to each other, um, the, the best we can measure with our current tools. So does language overlap in its neural substrates with any non-linguistic cognitive abilities? So over the years, many have argued for overlap between language processing and almost any aspect of cognition and even perception and motor control. Um, and I used to, you know, say it look kind of as a joke challenge in the talk, like you can give me any non-linguistic ability and I'll find you a paper that claims that language overlaps with it. Uh, most of these claims have, have concerned quote unquote Broca's area, um, which is a very, very um, dangerous term um, that's been misused and abused and um, led to a lot of um, misguided theorizing and a lot of confusion. But anyway, um, I'm going to argue that uh, language doesn't share resources with any of the abilities I mentioned. Uh, however, I'll also argue that in spite of the sharp separation between language and the rest of our cognitive arsenal, there is a deep connection between language and social cognition and a much stronger connection than that between uh, language and complex reasoning. And these are the main former and current um, students and postdocs uh, collaborators on this work. Okay. So to probe the relationship between any two cognitive abilities, there's two primary methods that have historically been used. Um, there's functional brain imaging and there's patient investigations. So first I'll present you some fMRI evidence. Um, so across uh, 32 experiments and several hundred participants, um, we tested for overlap between language processing and diverse perceptual modern cognitive abilities. So this is like the simplest kind of experiment you can do. You find the language regions in each individual brain. So you find them in Dort's brain, you find a mirror's brain, and then you say, okay, okay, these regions in their brains that work really hard when you process language, are they active when I, when I play you complex music? Are they active when you're engaging and thinking about what somebody else is thinking or when you're watching their gesturing or when you are solving a math problem, right? Um, and um, here are the responses to the sentence comprehension con condition um, and a control condition where people just read non-words like Blicket. This is from a, a visual version of the test, but as I mentioned, it's uh, very modality independent, so listening gives you a similar pattern of response. And everything here is plotted zero here is um, looking at a blank screen. So whatever is called, you know, resting low level baseline, right? Um, and now in different colors, I'll show you responses to different 
non-linguistic stimuli and tasks, um, spanning a wide range of um, abilities, including those linked to complex reasoning and social perception cognition. So I tried to group them into categories by color. So we have um, visual, social, and non-social cognition in yellow, uh, auditory uh, conditions in orange, including different kinds of music, language and music overlap has been a very um, uh, favored hypothesis for many years. Uh, hand and face motor control in red, numerical cognition in pink, um, reading computer code in purple, executive functions like inhibitory control and working memory in blue, categorization in teal, and visual event perception in green. Some of these include events that strongly evoke mentalizing, thinking about other spots. And as you can see, the brain areas that work really hard when we process language work about as hard when we're solving a math problem or hold information working memory as they do when we're looking at a blank screen. We can draw a line from our control condition, uh, the reading of non-words, and we can see that the only conditions that elicit a response reliably above it are visual meaningful events. So this green set on the right. Um, the response is still much lower than that elicited by sentences. And as I'll tell you in a second, Patients with severe linguistic deficits don't seem to have any issues with visual event semantics, suggesting that this response is not functionally critical. It's somewhat redundant with some other part of the brain that supports this ability. It's important to know that all of these 64 conditions elicit very robust responses somewhere in the brain. <laughs> so it's not like the brain is just not responding to these. It just happens to be outside of the boundaries of the system that processes linguistic information. And we can color all the conditions that check social processes in green and those that tax executive functions, reasoning and problem solving in blue. And as you can see, it's not the case that we systematically see stronger responses to the green or blue conditions. They're all kind of similarly low. The complementary approach um, to this question is to ask um, whether individuals who lack a properly functioning language system due to aphasia have troubles with some of these non-linguistic functions. And most telling are cases of what's called global aphasia, which results from severe damage to the language system, typically due to a massive stroke in the middle cerebral artery. Um, and here, are just brains of three sample patients, and you can see the extent is the extent of damage is really quite severe, wipes out a whole bunch of parasylvian cortex, frontal and temporal cortex. Um, and this kind of damage leads to profound deficits in both producing and understanding language. Uh, Rosemary Varley at UCL um, has been studying this population for many years now. And over the years, um, she and her colleagues examine a wide range of abilities in these individuals, including some stuff that we've done collaboratively. And strikingly, in spite of these profound linguistic deficits, globally aphasic individuals have intact um, arithmetic, logic, and problem-solving abilities. Um, they have intact executive control. Um, they can uh, appreciate structure in music, including quite subtle um, deviations from the uh, typical patterns. They understand what other people think, um, and they have a rich uh, understanding of how the world works. So the only thing these patients lack is the ability to convert their thoughts into a verbal format and to extract meaningful information from others' linguistic productions. And these findings, of course, align well with the picture that has emerged in our fMRI work, and as well as with self-reports of aphasic individuals going back centuries. Um, so for example, here's a quote from a German philosopher in the 18th century, Johann Spalding, uh, who wrote with presumably quite a big deal of effort, um, I saw and recognized everything around me in its true shape. I tried to speak to see if something coherent could be uttered, but no matter how much I focused intention and thoughts together, shapeless and entirely different words ensued rather than the ones I wanted. I therefore contented myself with the expectation that I would not be able to speak or write for the duration of my life, but that the principles and dispositions known to me would always remain the same. A couple of things to keep in mind about the separation between language and thought. Um, first, there's two, what I call non-implications of a functionally specialized language system. Um, and <laughs> I'm now emphasizing these points because this has led to a lot of confusion. So the first is that functional specialization in an adult brain does not imply innateness. Those are just not the same thing. It just does not follow. We know that specialization can and does develop as a function of our experience with the world. So one prime example of this is the visual word form area region and the visual cortex of literate individuals that responds incredibly selectively to letters in the script that's familiar to you, suggesting that parts of the visual cortex become specialized for, being, for discriminating these very similar looking 
objects, right, which are letters or characters or whatever. Um, and in fact, I don't have a stake in this race. I'm fighting too many battles as it is, but I would bet that the language system emerges as a function of learning um, the mapping between forms and meanings. We have to store that information somewhere and there we store it in the language system, makes sense. Um, anyway, the second is that the fact that um, language draws on specialized machinery, which like, plausibly stores our linguistic knowledge representations, doesn't mean that the computations that support language are fundamentally distinct from those that support information processing in other domains. In fact, I suspect, and there's some evidence from behavioral and computational modeling work, that the computations that have been invoked across domains for many years, like retrieval of representations from memory, predictive processing, integrating elements into more complex representations, are the very same ones that support um, language processing, along with vision and planning and uh, whatever else. Importantly, we have ample evidence now that such computations, in spite of their domain generality, um, are implemented locally within the language network rather than in some centralized hub that, for example, supports prediction in language and music, um, in uh, observing others' actions, and so on. Um, and you could have built a system another way, but presumably the computational metabolic efficiency that is afforded by local computation makes it so that all these computations that may be parallel and similar across domains are implemented in the parts of the brain that store the domain relevant representations. And uh, Corey Shane and I have a paper that I'm happy to share a draft of where we summarize a lot of that literature. Um, okay, and third, um, so we've talked about um, the separation between language and thought and fully formed brains, right? So you take an adult well-formed brain, you wipe out the language system with a big stroke, and they can still do all the thinking that they could before, they just can't convert it into language. But could language be critical for the development of some aspects of thought? Again, many arguments have been made in this respect. And of course, there's very few, um, we can't really do experiments here, right? We can't deprive kids of language and see what happens, uh, but a very useful um, for science natural experiment that happens quite a lot is when deaf kids are born to hearing parents, all right? So in fact, that's the majority of deaf kids. The majority of deaf kids are born to parents who have perfectly good hearing and so they, don't know ASL. And these kids for the first bunch of years, sometimes into their teenage years, get no exposure to language. So they're loved and um, you know, raised in all the ways in which hearing kids are, they just don't get linguistic exposure because their kids don't speak um, uh, ASL or whatever the sign language um, in the community. And there's been a lot of um, um, social and education movements to try to fix that situation. But from the individuals that we have who have been raised in such ways, we can ask whether something is different about how they think about the world. And again, quite strikingly to me, at least, um, most reasoning appears to be de to develop just fine with the striking exception of some aspects of theory of mind reasoning. So some aspects of thinking about others' minds seem to require linguistic input. And I'll come back to this point in just a few slides. So back to this diagram of different relationships um, uh, uh, between intersystem relationships, um, I showed you that with respect to overlap, language does not appear to overlap with social perception and cognition or with complex thought and reasoning. So now I'm going to try to convince you that there is a stronger connection between language and social cognition based on the proximity of the networks and um, uh, connectivity between them and some additional evidence. So let me introduce the two uh, other relevant systems. Um, to, so, so, so far we've focused on the language network and established its separability from a host of non-linguistic abilities. So I'll now explicitly tell you the networks that do actually support general reasoning and social cognition. So um, general reasoning draws on a bilateral network of frontal and parietal areas. Um, it's known in the literature by many names. The term I generally use is a term due, due to John Duncan. Uh, he calls it the multiple demand network. As the name suggests, the system is highly um, uh, domain general uh, and supports um, multiple kinds of cognitive demands. It's basically active during any effortful task, including your standard kind of executive function tasks like working memory and cognitive control tasks, um, uh, problem solving tasks and standard IQ tasks. Oh yeah, um, there. Um, and really, very importantly, the system has been strongly and causally linked to fluid intelligence. In fact, in cases of brain damage, you can calculate for, you know, a cubic 
centimeter of brain tissue falling within that system, you lose so many IQ points. It's a very, very tight and important relationship. So this system is very important. Take good care of it. It helps you think. Um, incidentally, I'm not going to go on this tangent, but incidentally, <laughs> because it's so robust and bilateral, it's actually not even considered in neurosurgical cases because you don't get an immediate deficit. But for those of you who are um, for whom thinking is important in their life, <laughs> you might want to talk to your neurosurgeon before they remove some parts of the system because I'd rather lose language than thinking, I think. Um, okay, so social cognition, including theory of mind or mentalizing, draws on a right lateralized system of frontal and temporal areas. This network responds to tasks that require thinking about other people in both verbal and pictorial materials across controlled and naturalistic paradigms. And a subset of this network is really the um, uh, kind of a very specialized um, uh, system for thinking what somebody else thinks in particular. So not just how they look or what their cultural preferences are or whether they're hungry, but specifically what the content of their mental um, states is. So here's why I think the language network and the social cognitive network are deeply interlinked. So first, in spite of different prominences in the left versus right hemisphere, so the theory of mind network is right hemisphere dominant, as I mentioned, the topographic patterns are broadly similar, especially in the temporal lobe. The frontal photographs are a little bit more distinct. And remember that in individual participants, those are fully dissociable. So here I'm showing you data from a, a colleague of mine from three individuals, red is language, green is theory of mind, they're fully distinct. But you can see the red and green areas are right next to each other, especially in the temporal lobe. And the fact that these two networks show this interdigitated pattern within broadly similar parts of the association cortex seems important. And like I said, in some such cases in the an animal literature, people have made arguments that maybe the system started out as one system and later split into these specialized sub-networks. Sub there is more. So not only language and theory of mind areas lay side by side in the temporal lobe, but other functions relevant to perceiving, understanding, and interacting with font specifics activate areas on the lateral temporal surface, from face and body perception, to voice recognition, to biological motion perception, um, to the perception of social interactions, and so on. These different functions have typically been studied by distinct subfields of, co of cognitive science and neuroscience, and I think this fractionation across fields may have obscured some pretty key generalizations, um, and I'd like to fix that um, in the years to come. And um, another point to mention is that in the first ever recent functional imaging study of uh, macaques, social processing in macaques, observing um, socially relevant signals was shown to recruit a network of brain areas whose topography eerily resembles the system that I've been talking about, the language system in humans. And similar results have now also been reported in marmosets. And to me, this suggests that there are some really deep evolutionary links um, between language and social cognition. So just to speculate a little bit here, perhaps evolutionarily, we started out with a broad swath of cortex that is receptive to all sorts of socially relevant information. And then as our brains became more complex, this cortex fractionated into myriad of distinct areas and networks, each specialized for the processing of a particular kind of visual, auditory, or conceptual information including um, a large chunk of cortex that in humans stores the multitude of our linguistic communicative signals. Um, if this process of recapitulated in human development this sometimes happens in cases of evolution, we should be able to test it um, and hopefully we'll be able to do that um, in the future. The second point I wanna make is in spite of their separability, the language and the social system have a non-trivial amount of um, what's referred to sometimes as functional synchronization or functional connectivity during naturalistic cognition. So um, one paradigm that's become increasingly common in cognitive neuroscience is instead of just asking which parts of the brain work more when you do X than Y, let's look at how different parts of the brain go up and down together as you're exposed to stimuli. And typically for, for such paradigms, people use um, rich naturalistic materials like uh, stories or movies, or they just ask you to do nothing for a few minutes, right? You engage in whatever uh, internal kind of thought processes you do um, uh, naturally. And then you can ask which bits of the brain co-oscillate um, together. And in general, these kinds of approaches have basically um, recovered the same networks that people have found with task paradigms. But there's also um, some interesting things about the inter-network interactions. So what we did, um, uh, in a couple of studies, is we basically found the language regions, 
the theory of mind regions in green um, and the multiple demand, these executive control regions in blue. And from each region, we extracted this pattern of um, uh, bold signal fluctuations, which is basically, you know, it's related to blood flow, but it indexes um, neuronal firing rates. And then we looked at how similar the fluctuations are among the regions within each network compared to between region pairs that straddle multiple networks, okay? So in these red, green, and blue arrows are, um, uh, are th these questions are addressing questions like, um, if your frontal language region goes up and down in this pattern, does your temporal language region mirror that pattern and co-oscillate co with it, right? And whereas here in these between systems, say this purple arrow, you ask, okay, if I look at your language region and one of your executive regions, is there any correlation in how they go up and down together? Okay. And so um, uh, we replicate others' work and finding these strong within system correlations. So all the language regions talk to each other. Well, that's how people interpret these things. If they co-oscillate means there's some information transfer going on. So that's the red, green, and blue bars, the theory of mine and the um, uh, executive regions. The language and the executive system, the multiple demand system, the purple bar, there is no correlation between them. Okay, so whatever the language system is doing is totally different from what the executive system is doing is really zero. But the language and social system show this non-trivial amount of interaction. And again, these regions are non-overlapping. And it's not, so remember how I told you that these regions are closer to each other than the language and the multiple demand regions. So it's not driven by proximity. Even if you take a language and theory of mind region far away, uh, you find this um, stronger co-oscillation than between say a language and an executive region close by. So it's not just because they're closer, it's not falling out of that. It's an independent source of evidence. Um, okay, so this suggests that the language and theory of mind networks may work together more than the language and the multiple demand network. Um, a few other reasons that I'll just mention briefly here for a deep link between language and social cognition include things like um, linguistic exchanges being generally dominated by social information, mentalizing being critical for language understanding. So we've heard a few talks today about non-literal um, understanding and inferences that we make when we understand language. Um, early developing social competence, competencies like joint attention are likely important for things like language acquisition. Some people have explicitly argued that. Um, and language may be critical for developing some aspects of theory of mind. I mentioned um, uh, briefly evidence from the deaf kids born to hearing parents. There's a few other strands of um, evidence um, for, for this link, like for example, if you train kids who have who do not yet pass what's known as a false belief task, which requires understanding what somebody else is thinking, um, if you train them on some linguistic constructions like the sentential complement constructions or verbs um, of uh, mental state attribution, that leads them to uh, pass um, the theory of mind um, uh, benchmark earlier than kids who are not trained in this way. There's this, a few relevant bodies of literature for that link. So now shifting gears to look more deeply within the language system itself to see if some of its properties, um, some of the properties of the representations and computations may give hints as to um, the functional um, uh, goal of language. Okay, so I'm gonna argue here that some properties make it well-suited for communication and some other properties actually make it not suitable for complex thought. Okay, so there's at least two features of language that make it likely that communication is its primary function. So first, natural languages are highly efficient for information transfer. So there is now ample evidence um, that natural languages have been shaped by communicative pressures at all levels from the sound systems to um, lexicons to grammars, leading to linguistic code that is both uh, short, making it easy to produce, um, and contextually disambiguated and redundant, making it easy to understand and robust to noise. Now, if language evolved for um, internal thought, it's unclear why it would exhibit such characteristics. Um, a lot of the work um, uh, in this area is summarized in this uh, relatively recent paper from uh, Ted Gibson and colleagues in um, transcognitive sciences. And second, um, language processing appears to rely on predictive coding. Again, if this idea has come up in a few talks already. So prediction in language really only makes sense from the perspective of a comprehender who is trying to infer the intended meaning from a linguistic signal. 
Um, and engaging in predictive processing basically facilitates that process by reducing the effort because the expected elements are now pre-activated. Again, it's unclear why or how our language processing mechanisms would have become predictive if language was primarily an internal system of thought. Um, in terms of the evidence for predictive processing in language, there is now numerous behavioral and brain imaging investigations that show um, uh, that comprehenders engage in predictive processing. Um, I'll just mention a study here from uh, uh, Corey Shane and Adam Blank um, in my group, where we basically had participants listen to uh, naturalistic stories in the scanner. And we coded these materials for two kinds of surprisal, which is a formal metric of predictability. So, um, and this is just a sample chunk of a story showing these two codings. Um, so what we mean by lexicalized surprisal is basically n-gram surprisal based on sequences of five words. Um, and syntactic surprisal is based on uh, probabilistic context-free grammar parser. So um, expectance is based on preceding uh, chunks of um, structure. Uh, and we found um, robust and independent effects of both lexicalized and syntactic surprisal um, in the language system. And these effects, these um, predictors explain a, a substantial chunk of variance in the neural fluctuation patterns. But I want to tell you about another very, I think, very powerful source of evidence for the role of prediction in language, uh, which comes from artificial neural network language models. So there have long been two barriers to going beyond verbal descriptive hypotheses about language mechanisms. One is that the only um, model organism we have available to us is humans, and there are limited ways in which we can probe the human brain. Now, there are some aspects of speech perception and motor control that can be studied in other systems, but the uh, mapping between uh, symbolic representations and meanings um, uh, is harder. Uh, and the other is that we've lacked adequate computationally explicit accounts of how meaning could be extracted from language. However, just a few years ago, the second barrier has been lifted, and I wouldn't have predicted that for the life of me, like in grad school, if you asked me, like, will we have models that do as well as they do on language tasks? I would have said, no, you're crazy. Um, but increases in um, computing power, availability of vast corpora, and machine learning advances have led to this um, real uh, set of breakthroughs in artificial intelligence, including language, where suddenly um, uh, artificial neural networks, uh, uh, artificial neural network models of language, especially what's known as the transformer architectures like GPT-2, which um, have been made it to the popular media, um, uh, seem to be able to answer questions, generate freeform text, translate between languages. Um, you may know about a whole wave of criticisms of these models, but I think they're largely totally misguided because what they're generally being criticized for is not being able to think. Now, why would these models learn to think? They're exposed to regularities in language. The human language system can't think, as I've told you in the first part. So in fact, what I think these models are trained to do, they do really, really well, exquisitely well. Um, and I'll come back to the thinking part um, in the future directions slide, but anyway. Um, the fact that these highly successful models are all trained on general word prediction tasks suggests that, um, or can be taken to suggest that this form of training leads to flexible and robust linguistic representations that approximate meaning well enough to perform this, you know, pretty broad range of language tasks, presumably because it encourages the network to build um, a joint probability model of the linguistic signal, if you wish. So basically, to successfully predict the next word, you need to take into account a host of um, uh, distributional properties, like the structure, the word co-occurrences, the whatever approximation of meaning you've derived, and so on and so forth. And, um, and maybe that's what humans are doing too. And so in recent work, we've tried to explicitly link the representations extracted from these um, models to representations that we extract from the human brain as they process language. So this effort has been led by graduate student Martin Schrempf, and he adopted an approach which has been incredibly successful in the domain of vision, which he calls integrative benchmarking. And the essence of this approach is to move from these earlier, some of the earlier attempts where you take a single model and a single data set and you say, oh, look, my model fits this data set, um, to an approach where you take all the available models that you know pass some competitiveness level in performance on existing benchmarks, you take the, all the available data sets that are available to you, and you see what makes some models 
fit human data or monkey data better on average. And then you try to take the models apart to isolate the factors that matter. So we're basically looking for consistent patterns and performance across many different models applied to multiple data sets together with seeing how they perform on the proposed core computational function of the system in question, like object recognition and vision, or say next word prediction in language. So um, we took 43 state-of-the-art language models and compared them against um, three human uh, data sets. The approach is really not very complicated. You basically take the same stimuli um, and you have data from humans having processed them and you feed the same stimuli to models you extract and you use like, you know, I don't know, 80% of the data to do this. Um, and then you extract the representation from models and you train a regression to predict uh, from the model representations, human neural responses. And here we've done this on both fMRI and intracranial recording data. And then you fix your regression and then you say, okay, how well can this now predict responses to the left out 20% of the data that um, haven't been used in training? Okay, it's exactly building very straightforwardly on all the um, uh, similar stuff in vision. Um, so first we ask how well do these models do? Like if they can only capture, you know, a teeny fraction of the brain variance, then like, I don't care, right? Like then, you know, maybe I'll wait until these models get better. And to my incredible surprise, um, uh, some of these models do really well. So here I'm plotting normalized productivity. So the ceiling in gray here is based on the internal reliability of the data set. So basically how well you can predict one subject's responses from the average of other subjects. So it's kind of kind of about how about as, as well as you can do. And the individual bars here are different models and similar colors indicate similar model architectures. So uh, two things to note, um, there is um, quite a lot of variance in how well different models do. So these on the left are these embedding models, then there's some recurrent um, uh, neural network models and most of these architectures are these transformer type um, models. Um, and um, um, right, and, and, and so some models um, uh, on the right here, you can see that basically already hit the estimated ceiling uh, in this data set, suggesting that, um, you know, can basically fully capture the neural responses in the brain to novel stimuli, which is um, uh, a little bit insane. Uh, but, you know, so, so I'll, I'll come back to the limitations here and tell you how we're going to push this forward. But next and critically, here's the bit where I think um, we have good evidence for prediction being the core optimizing function. We ask, do the models that best perform on a next word prediction task uh, also provide a better fit to human neural data, right? And so now here I'm plotting on the x-axis model performance on the next word prediction task. And here, um, smaller values on the right are better. And on the y-axis is normalized neural productivity. And now models are gonna be individual dots. And you find that there's a strong relationship between these two things. So models that do well on uh, predicting the next word provide the best fit to human neural data. Now you may wonder if models that do better are just bigger models, they have more parameters to fit. No, that's not the case because you can take um, uh, an embedding of the same size, but without any of the architectural priors that transformers have, and those do very poorly. So it's not just being able to fit um, a lot of parameters. Now, importantly, it's not the case that performance on any language benchmark would lead to better predictivity of the human brain. It seems that next word prediction is special. And to address this, we looked at model performance on a set of language tasks um, from what's known as the GLUE benchmark um, uh, set, which include also pretty sophisticated things like judging a sentence, whether it's grammatically well-formed or not, uh, judging two sentences for how similar they are. Um, and here, uh, here's the, again, all the dots are individual models. There is no relationship either on average for performance on these on this blue benchmark or individually. So these are the gray bars are performance uh, model performance. No, gray bars are correlations between model performance and brain productivity, what we call brain scores uh, for all these different linguistic tasks. And the only one that's um, uh, robust is this next word uh, prediction task. And the selective relationship suggests that maybe optimizing for predictive representations is a critical objective of both um, biological and artificial neural networks um, for language. So now I wanna briefly tell you about, I now have about like eight minutes left, I think. Um, I wanna mention two properties of language that actually make it not well-suited or even compatible with um, uh, complex thought. 
So one is that um, complex thought generally involves relating different propositions to each other. So it naturally requires integration of information over quite extended temporal contexts. Yet the language system appears to have a relatively short, what's known as temporal receptive window. So this notion of temporal receptive window has been growing in popularity in large, due to, in large part due to um, Uri Hassan's work in Princeton. Um, you can think of temporal of, of these temporal receptive windows as an analog of spatial receptive fields in the visual cortex, right? Where we start out with very, very tiny receptive fields that just track like line orientation, then they get slightly larger being able to, you know, track parts of objects and then they get larger to recognize spaces and so on and so forth. So this is basically a temporal analog of that. Um, and we've long known that the language system is not at all sensitive to the structure of the discourse level, okay? So you can give it um, a beautifully connected set of sentences which tell a story or something like that versus a set of sentences that have nothing to do with each other and the response is not different. So you basically max out once you get to the level of sentences and it, it doesn't increase further. Um, and um, other recent work actually suggests that the temporal receptive window of the language system is as short as about six words. So this means that context beyond six words prior to the word you're processing is not, a, is not gonna affect the processing of the current input. Okay, this is very short and uh, surprising, right? Of course, we know that we have mechanisms in our brains that keep track of information over longer time scales. In fact, um, a system I haven't talked about today known as the default network appears to have very long integration windows uh, for both stories and movies and things like that. Um, it's just, <laughs> it just so happens that the system that crunches linguistic input um, doesn't engage in this longer scale integration, suggesting presumably that what you do in language is you keep track of these local linguistic contexts, you extract more abstract, abstract representations, and then you ship them down to the system that then engages in whatever reasoning it may want to do on those representations. And we can, um, oh yeah, uh, the default mode network. And it's separate from, this is less relevant to this crowd, Let's skip this point. And now I want to argue specifically about, um, against another core aspect of the Trumps, on the Chomskyan perspective of language, um, which is the following. So here's a figure from a 2013 uh, text review paper where um, language, which is this blue box here, is proposed to consist of syntactic rules and representations along with words. Uh, and the system connects to um, the external um, uh, sensory motor interface in red uh, and the perceptual, so, so this is basically like your perceptual and motor components of language and the internal conceptual interface in orange. So that's effectively thought. And the focus in this tradition has been on syntactic rules and representations. Um, which in the last couple of decades have been reduced to the single, yeah, I said that, have been reduced to the single operation of merge, um, which is whatever computational mechanism um, uh, that includes some operation that constructs new representational element Z from already constructed elements um, X and Y. Um, and the key idea here is that um, uh, this operation evolved in language and then enabled greater complexity in the internal conceptual intentional interface effectively allowing for more complex thoughts. And this, importantly, this combinatorial operation is argued to be highly abstract in that it doesn't care what it is that it's combining as long as it's of the right type, uh, broadly speaking. However, the abstractness of syntax and natural language has long been questions in linguistics, psycholinguistics, language development, neuroscience, natural language processing, like any field that has seriously tackled this issue has basically said, look, it doesn't seem like language relies on these highly abstract um, kinds of rules. And in terms of what we have learned um, uh, on the neuroscience side, I can tell you that there is no such thing as a syntax region in your brain. There is nothing that just does syntax and doesn't care about word meanings that just doesn't exist. I mean, I looked for it for 10 years and it's just not there. Um, there is no region that is selective for syntax and that you, you certainly find the whole language system is very sensitive to syntactic information. It's just that every bit of it that cares about syntax measured in a gazillion different ways will be just as sensitive to representations of single word meaning. So it will, it will respond more to table than blicket. okay? So that's the same bits that also do things like composition. Um, 
more generally, arguments and evidence are accumulating against the distinction between memory and computation in the brain. Um, and for memory being an active participant in neural computation, which kind of fits nicely with this notion that I mentioned where um, the language system stores your language representations. And then it's basically that system that uses these stored representations to either interpret um, incoming me messages or um, generate outgoing ones. If you're interested in this general distinction between memory and computation, I recommend um, these two papers in uh, Trends and Cognitive Sciences. Um, and arguments for the lack of the distinction between the two come from both neurobiology, where you don't have separate neurons that process information versus store information. It's just not a thing that has been found anywhere in biology. Um, and what we've learned for, about efficient computation in general. So memory allows for the reuse of past computations through what's um, known as memoization and um, computer science. So the results of function calls are stored and can be called upon when the same input occurs again uh, in the future. And in fact, recent machine learning algorithms, including ones in these artificial neural network language models that I mentioned, they have these um, powerful uh, function approximation architectures that kind of adaptively determine what information to store, at what grain of abstraction and scale is it helpful to um, keep track of things. I'm gonna skip this. Um, yeah, so language um, does not seem to rely on this abstract combinatorial operation um, like merge. And so combined with the fact that engaging in complex thought doesn't even engage the language system, it's just not clear how language could have given rise to complex thought and reasoning. So going back to this question I posed, what is the primary function of language? Is it to think complex thoughts or to share thoughts with each other? I've shown you that although language is um, highly segregated from the rest of the brain, and is strongly specialized for linguistic processing. There is a deep connection between the language system and the system that supports social cognition and perception, um, a deeper one than the one between language and complex reasoning. Um, and further, some properties, properties of language make it um, well suitable for communication, and some other properties make it actually um, not well suited for um, complex thought. And I think both of these um, um, lines of evidence support the communicative function of language and suggest the, um, the idea that language evolved to allow for more complex reasoning um, is unlikely. So um, just to end with a speculation, I won't talk about future directions, I'll just um, leave it there. So I think evolutionarily humans got smarter due to the massive expansion of the association cortex and so the ability to store more information. Perhaps accompanying this increase was an increase in social intelligence, or maybe the social intelligence actually drove the whole thing with the increase of social groups. Um, eventually, these increases called for a more sophisticated communication system to enable more complex cooperative behaviors. And then maybe um, language evolution has led to a further increase in um, social reasoning abilities. So, um, I think I'm just gonna end here and maybe some of the other points can come back um, uh, in the question period. So thanks so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you all the people who helped in all the comments. Sources and stuff. Thank you, Ev, for an absolutely fascinating, thought-provoking, toward the forest talk, tackling all the biggest questions. Um, so I will moderate your questions for you, if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, just anyone who wants to ask, lift your virtual um, hand. And if you want to stop sharing to see people, yeah. then whatever is best for you. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Jack, you go first. Oh, oh you can't, we can't hear you. Thank you for a very exciting talk with uh, many different uh, aspects. Um, uh, you, you do say that uh, language is uh, linked to social cognition and not so much to complex thoughts. Uh, I think it's interesting that uh, one aspect that drives structural complexity is the need to report uh, social facts like what somebody said. So uh, it, this, uh, I don't think there's a contradiction here. Uh, I think you're, you're not saying that uh, people don't do complex thinking, but that these are not naturally mapped in the brain. But it's interesting to me that social uh, reality of, of trying to say, uh, she said that something, uh, mm -hmm. this is a, a source uh, that would push us to the limits of our complexity, perhaps. That's interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's um, much to say in response. I mean, I, I don't think it's contradictory. I mean, I think the fact, 
in fact, like gossip that has been proposed to be one of the driving forces early on and the changes in the language system. I mean, gossip effectively is that, right? It's talking about other people's properties and mental state and uh, attributing um, utterances. Um, and uh, we're starting to maybe look a little bit at conversation more generally because like I've spent the last, um, you know, whatever, 15 years doing studying language in the way that most people study language, which is with these isolated sentences taken out of context. We're now trying to move a little more towards more kind of conversational settings to incorporate all the extra linguistic information as well and um, hopefully have updates soon enough. If I could just briefly follow up, I think your, your six word uh, limit that you mentioned is uh, suspiciously similar to intonation unit size. So that's a uh, Indeed. This is a really nice size chunk of, of yeah. language there. I'd love to, like if, I mean, I know some of that literature, but I've thought about that connection and I'd love to hear more on what the latest is there. So maybe I'll follow up with you, that's okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Dorit, and before Dorit, there is actually a recent paper by Maya Inbaru somewhere in the audience uh, about measuring uh, cross-linguistically the timing of international units and finding them extremely ah. similar. Oh, that's She's cool. in the audience somewhere. Uh, Dorit. Yeah, uh, thank you for this mind-blowing uh, presentation. There is one, one, one thing I'd like to focus on. Everything you've said about language being not uh, fit for complex thought is uh, actually about spoken language. Whereas uh, all of these limitations are uh, taken away when you deal with written language. And in fact, uh, there is lots of evidence that uh, you need complex language to engage with complex syntax in writing, really complex syntax, and that complex uh, structures drive complex thought, and all of these grow richer with uh, age and school. Yeah, I mean, so, so to clarify, the effects that I mentioned, like the non-sensitivity to discourse grains, and the, the temporal window, that seems to not depend on modality presentation, at least in the system that I'm, I was talking about today. So there you can present materials visually, one word at a time, you can present them auditorially, and you find similar kinds of signatures. Now, how written language may have increased linguistic and or other kinds of complexity, I think is a fascinating question. There's some suggestive evidence that maybe some of the, um, contributions of the executive um, uh, components of the brain comes into play when we deal with uh, this secondary modality of language. Although the nature of the relationship, I think there's a lot still to spell out. <laughs> there's uh, the evidence, the evidence is the empirical landscape is complex, let's put it that way. But I think those links are very important. And I think we also all share, well, some of us may share intuition um, that sometimes when we have something in our heads and we think it's all clear and we got it, and then we try to write it out and, we're, and some things are not quite worked out, turns out. And so there is something where converting things into this extended narrative helps crystallize some aspects of thought. And that's like kind of a, a little bit of a flip side of things that I've talked about, but I find that um, general set of questions very interesting to explore more. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm gonna uh, move on to uh, Balthazar Bickel, but before that, one question from the Q&A. Um, what is the base of defining word? Is it cross-linguistically analyzed similarly in terms of your finding? So, so I missed the first bit. What's the... What is the base of defining word in your context? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Word, word is uh, probably not the right unit. It's just easiest to operationalize. It's most likely bits of information. Of course, uh, things are packaged differently into words in different languages. So for now, we're actually trying to establish the cross-linguistic um, a pattern of this temporal receptive window and we are operationalizing it as words experimentally, but we may learn that the differences that we see will actually be driven by the fact that more is packaged into words and like the gluten of languages. Balthazar. Yeah, I was really interested in what you said about the theory of mind and I was wondering whether you comment on how your findings and your theories square with, uh, with these observations that great apes have a theory of mind understanding at least to some level and also how you, you, your theory compares to these uh, ideas of uh, Robin Dunbar's uh, about the social brain and you know the orbital frontal lobe being critically involved and so on. I was just wondering how you think about these things. I'm well. very sympathetic to those things. I mean I 
<laughs> I very strongly believe in biological continuity. Like I think to postulate that humans evolved some fundamentally new computation or fundamentally different brain region, you need to have damn strong evidence. And that's just not there. To the extent that there are brain regions that don't seem to have clear homologs, um, there are like the frontal polar regions that are far away from language and other things. They're even far away from the social medial frontal regions, but anyway, so it's, it's not really clear like that they haven't talked as an apex of complex behaviors, but even so like all of the language and social machinery seems to find very clear homologies um, between humans and non-human animals. Um, and I think a lot can be gained from uh, systematic parallel investigations like Mike Tomasello has been doing behaviorally for many, many years. But I think there is a, um, a neuroscience uh, approach um, that can also be much more parallel than has been previously um, tackled. And that's one of the directions that I'm hoping <laughs> to go in where I think to understand how human brains have the properties that they do, we have to better understand um, the structure of the social system and the non-human primates. And like I said, there's an emergence of uh, brain imaging work on marmosets and macaques, uh, which provides some kind of preliminary tantalizing suggestions that there may be um, some bases for what later became um, uh, a language system, but a lot okay. to discover. So. Let's find my question a bit more like, I mean, uh, apes have no, you made a connection between theory of mind and language, but the problem is now that if apes have a certain level of theory of mind and no language, I just don't have the, I, I just don't think they have um, that much complex thinking. Like I think a communication system is going to reflect the complexity of thought. Maybe they just don't have that much to say to each other. Like to the extent that they have information to share, they can do it with the kind of communication system they have. Like, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's all speculative, but I just think um, like a huge, huge thing that happened is the expansion of the association cortex, which is the cortex that does stuff not related to perception and motor control. And like, that's the stuff that we have that allows us to now think like, you know, what am I going to do a month from now? Like, am I going to marry this uh, monkey or whatever, <laughs> pursue a relationship? Or am I going to, you know, like plan and all these things? And I think the richness of that will eventually manifest as outward need to share those mental states because we're fundamentally very social animals. And if we're thinking complex thoughts, would, I'd like to know what you think about. And I'd like to know what Inval thinks about, right? And um, so. Thank you. We have, we're going to have time for two more questions. So Yael and then Natalia, and I'm afraid we're going to have to end yeah. this very long day. Um, there are some questions if you have time later to answer in the chat, but then Yael and then Somebody Natalia. can paste it for me. Oh yeah, I do see them. Okay, I can maybe just copy and paste them for now. Uh -huh. Go ahead. myself. Um, I, I have so many questions. I just uh, ask uh, if I understood you correctly, then the prediction would be that uh, people who have, I don't know what you mean by social cognition, but people who have autistic features would presumably uh, have more language impairments than those who don't which turns out not to be the case, and uh, vice versa. People who are masters of language should be very um, eloquent in social cognition, and often it's not the case. So it, you, you're making very, very strong predictions which are not borne out by the facts. Unless you have a, a concept of social cognition, which I'm not, sure, I, I'm not seeing. This is one very uh, interesting uh, uh, challenge for your theory. The I other one would be, just a second, the other one would be, um, I think um, perhaps part of the uh, problem we are having with understanding longer uh, texts, where you say that the shorter memory only uh, uh, can hold, store certain uh, portions, maybe you're burdening things on memory and uh, rather than language. And I think maybe... the whole brain is memory. <laughs> Sorry? I think, I think the whole brain does memory. Like, I don't know what it means to, I think most systems store information, right? And they use it to compute things. So well. you're separating language. So you have a very, very heavy burden on memory and you're taking the load off of language. That's what you're doing. 
in order to understand. But I don't think there's a separate system that does memory from the system that does language. I think the to the extent that there's memory demands in language, it's implemented in the system that does language, and there's a lot of evidence for that. But just to address your question about polygenic disorders like autism, those are incredibly complex disorders. They're very poorly understood. And yes, there are dissociations between language and social aspects of cognition. I certainly would not say that they're one and the same. There should be some relationships that you should be able to measure behaviorally, but um, complications arise at all levels. One, there's no good measures of social competence that elicit reliable variance in um, adult neurotypical or higher functioning individuals. Those just don't exist. There's a few groups trying to develop them. So that question, you say that that's not true. Um, I don't think we have good enough data to evaluate those claims. In general, if you look across a lot of polygenic disorders, um, neurological disorders, you find that language and social skills often do go together. Um, you know, like the common examples are, you know, the Williams syndrome, they tend to both be preserved in a lot of individuals with autism. There's some impairments that are both um, linguistic and social in nature. So there's actually very suggestive correlational evidence, but um, I just don't think, um, I just don't think we know for sure one way or the other yet. I just don't think the evidence is there. Thanks. Um, Thanks. So our last question and a short one, it will have to be Natalia. Yes, thanks a lot, and it will be a really short question, I guess. Um, so uh, what do you think about some attempts, and uh, maybe they're successful, uh, to find merge in the brain, uh, like in Broadman Area 44? So does it have any uh, consequences for your theory? What do you think about that? Well, I mean, the, the answers are going to have to be in how good you think that evidence is, right? And I don't think that there is um, any compelling evidence that there is a part of the brain that does syntactic combinatorial processing that uh, is sep that one does something different from the rest of the language system and two that does just that and not also things like processing word meanings and combining them semantically into complex representations. You know, I, I review some of the literature. I have a 2020 cognition paper where some of that is um, kind of outlined, like why I think the prior evidence, people make strong claims, but the devil is going to be in how good the evidence is supporting them. Thank you. Thank you, Ev, for an absolutely fantastic talk and a fantastic thank close to this day. Um, thank you all for being here, and we will all meet again tomorrow. Any, 